Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Space Week Live for Sunday, July 5th, 2020, the year to end all years. It's been an eventful couple of weeks. Uh, there was no Space Week last week because I was attending a surprise birthday party for a family friend. But here we are, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So, first of all, um, China actually live-streamed a, uh, a launch for the first time in years, I guess. Um, it was a, uh, a Long March 3B rocket launching uh, the last of their Beidou 3 GPS satellites. I, they're not, they're Beidou 3 navigation satellites. They're equivalent, they're China's equivalent to GPS. GPS is our system. But uh, here, let's take a look. Let us make sure that we have audio. Yes, we do. Okay, here we go. Gunung 宜宾 So the mission was a uh, complete success and the broadcast was quite impressive. Um, they had, what was it, nine cameras, something like that? I mean, seven or eight of which were working, uh, all on different, different stream sources. Um, it was actually quite complicated to, to try to um, live stream because uh, there were so many different sources that uh, uh, they were tough to juggle. But I recorded uh, all of them, and at some point, as time permits, I'm going to edit together. Um, okay, that's, that's great. I can't understand Chinese. <laughs> I'm going to edit together a, uh, a compilation of, a uh, synchronized compilation of, of um, uh, uh, the launch videos so that we can see it from different angles, similar to the, um, the live broadcast, but in a, uh, a grid orientation. So, uh, the rocket, I'm seeing who asked what the rocket was? Andrija, Andrija, Gorup, Andrija Gorup, uh, uh, Indian, I presume, and so the I I am guessing I pronounced the J. Uh, in any case, rocket was a Long March 3B. Uh, most of the Chinese rockets are called Long March, one thing or another, and um, this was a Long March 3B rocket, um, and uh, again last of the beta three satellites um next up oh hold on let me yeah oh electron uh, we will get to that later in the later in the uh, space we broadcast okay fumes yeah so here let's real quick look up um the Long March 3B rocket, because I don't offhand recall uh, what sort of fuel it uses. It uses boosters, first stage propellant. Uh, yeah, it's hypergolic. The, it uses hypergolic fuels, dinitrogen tech uh, dinitrogen tetroxide and uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, um, hypergolic fuels, which is the reason for all the nasty uh, orange smoke, because that's that's what uh, the hypergolics produce. Very toxic, but uh, 
uh, stable and effective um, propellants that don't need cryogenic uh, cooling. Uh, Peter S. blows him away that China's space launch complex isn't on the coast. I mean, China has multiple launch complexes, um, and none of them are on the coast. <laughs> they have a long coast, so that is odd. Maybe that's because um, the interior of the country is more secure, uh, and China is all about that security. Um or perhaps there's too much population on the coast and they couldn't find a good spot for it. I don't know. But, um, but it would be an interesting question to delve more deeply into why do countries... Well, I mean, obviously, putting a launch facility on the eastern coast of your nation, if you have an east coast, uh, is logical. But if you do not, uh, it's a good question to ask why that choice was made. Um, so, oh, and I should mention, um, I don't actually have my, my version of the, my live stream of the, uh, the uh, Long March 3B up, but uh, if, if during that stream you noticed that the uh, um, <laughs> one, one of the four uh, rockets launched before the other three, that's because the source video feeds from China were not synchronized. Uh, some of the feeds were lagging by a few seconds. So, um, that was, <laughs> I actually didn't notice that until the actual launch because um, there, were no, there was no frame of reference for synchroniza synchronizing the different video feeds, but yeah, there you go. That's why I want to edit together a properly synchronized one. Um, next up, we had a couple of spacewalks. Um, space, U.S. spacewalk number 65 and number 66 with uh, ISS Commander Chris Cassidy and Bob Behnken, who came up on the Crew Dragon. Uh, they were both doing what we have seen so many times this past year. They were replacing old nickel hydrogen batteries with, um, these are big batteries, 400, approximately 400 pounds each, uh, replacing old nickel hydrogen batteries with new lithium ion batteries. And uh, so they had two spacewalks, both successful on each of the spacewalks. They were able to get their stuff done early and, uh, uh, and proceed on to get ahead, get ahead tasks is what they call them. Um, so uh, one phrase that kept getting repeated, and, uh, and this, seems to be, so this seems to have been different from the previous battery swap uh, live streams, or uh, spacewalks, uh, and that is that they kept stating who had control of the battery, and that maybe that's a procedure that they, uh, a new procedure that they developed, um, that they added to the to the litany of procedures they have to follow, but uh, along with the glove and hap checks and everything else, um, it's possible that there was some confusion as to. Um, who had con who was physically grasped onto the uh, the battery last uh, during during a previous spacewalk? I, I don't recall. I, I don't remember any issue like that. But uh... you have control. You have control. So we see there the handoff. Uh, I don't remember which astronaut wore the red stripe. Um, assuming it was Chris Cassidy, the ISS commander, uh, he handed off the uh, the battery unit to um, Bob Behnken. And then the next one, just some scenic views. Um, so this, I believe, th I think they actually have one or two more spacewalks to do before they complete the batteries the battery swap outs for the for the um, space station uh, it's been a long process because there's a lot of batteries but um, uh, whether this was the last battery uh, swap out live I mean uh, spacewalk or not uh, they do have one or two more spacewalks to do in the next month or or two 
which um, have not yet shown up on the TV schedule, but uh, once they do, I'll get them scheduled so that uh, I can bring them to you live. Hey, Justin, I've got the uh, GoPro and the uh, Mutt and its associated Rex. Hmm. That's the GoPro floating around in front of them, presumably with the SD card inserted. <laughs> um, okay, addressing the chat. Let's see. Um, Hitchum Mosen is saying those those old batteries have a lifespan of, of around 10 years. The ISS shouldn't be there for longer than that. Um, using brand new lithium ion batteries that can last for 20 plus years have a hidden meaning. That's, um, uh, that's a hopeful statement. Uh, I like that. Um, of course, the ISS is only like commissioned through, what is it, 2024 or 2026? I'm not sure what the latest number is. Um, there have been fears that after its scheduled life is done, that it would be deorbited and we would lose our uh, flagship outpost, our only outpost in space. Um, but... Uh, um, yeah, it is a good point that one of the, uh, well, this, this late in the game, just a few years before the end of the, the ISS's current uh, uh, life schedule, they are adding long-lasting brand new batteries. Um, so we shall have to wait and see. Uh, do they not already? Okay, Thomas T is asking. Do they not already have advanced lithium-ion batteries with graphene? I'm not sure what technology is incorporated. What battery technology is incorporated in the in the lithium-ion batteries that they um, are using on the station now? Uh, I know that putting anything. I mean, anything that goes to space, anything, any sort of operational hardware that goes to space, has to be rigorously tested and and redundant with redundant designs and and uh it's takes years to develop uh, basically any hardware that goes to space uh, even simple things and so i don't i don't know if they have the latest and greatest battery technology incorporated into those uh those packs that they've been installing Okay, Andrija Gorup is asking about the electron second stage. Again, I'll get to electron a little later in the broadcast. Uh, have a couple more, well, one more event to discuss before that. Graphene battery is not a thing yet. Light ion is proven for a while now. Okay, all right. Next up, we have a Falcon 9 launch, our uh, one of our favorites. Um, this one, though, was not a Starlink. This was a GPS satellite, uh, a new GPS, what, GPS-3? Uh, GPS-3, SVO-3. So this is a new generation S, uh, GPS satellite launched into medium Earth orbit by uh, ye old SpaceX Falcon 9. Let's check it out. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. Go Falcon, go GPS. Plus 40 seconds, we've heard callouts, and now we're entering the throttle bucket. We're powering down the Merlin engines. So, um, 
Let's see, did they broadcast the uh, the release of the satellite? Yes, they did. Do, do, do. Maybe. Oh, here we go. Yep, so, um, yeah, so I'm not sure, uh, I do not recall if um, this represented the, the last of the GPS-3 satellites to be deployed, um, but uh, uh, in any case, onward and upward as they say. Ah, Maria Kutujan asked if um, if the uh, let's see were the lithium-ion batteries already on the ISS. The video just shows them transferring the batteries from one place to another. So what happens is, or what happened was, the batteries uh, were delivered, I think, on the Japanese HTV, uh, the H2 transfer vehicle uh, cargo craft. It's the big uh, soda can looking looking uh, spacecraft that, that Japan launches up to the ISS. So the batteries uh, ha have been launched on multiple HTV craft up to the ISS and then uh, they um, you know they, they pre-position the batteries uh, before the spacewalk. Uh, so that the astronauts have easy access to them. I think they put them on a on a pallet that that uh, they, they may even put them on a pallet that's on tracks that um, rolls out to the to the to near the work site. Um, uh, they have a like a little train track that that rolls up and down the outside of the ISS that they can attach hardware to. Um, I forget what it's called. It has an acronym, of course. But, uh, yeah, so they do pre-position the batteries out there um, for them to, to work. And they don't have to lug the batteries around, like, manually too much. But, um, all right. Now, Rocket Lab. So, um, yesterday, was it? It was actually, uh, um, yeah, it was actually yesterday. Wow, time time flies. Um Rocket Lab uh, attempted to launch uh, their electron rocket with three Earth imaging satellite payloads, one for Canon, the, the, the uh, camera maker, uh, one for um, uh, for, for Planet, and one for in space missions. Uh, thus, the mission, the uh, launch was called Pixar. It didn't happen. Uh, they always make sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, names for their for their uh, uh, launches. Uh, so everything looked good uh, up until second stage separation, and uh, something happened. We're not sure what yet. Something happened, and um, the rocket appeared to lose its thrust and uh, entered what appeared to be a more ballistic trajectory, that is to say, without thrust. And the rocket and the payloads were lost. Of course, um, afterwards, uh, Rocket Lab followed up with apologies to their customers, promises to investigate, solve the problem, and move on. And they received lots of emotional support from Twitter followers and... Uh, um, Elon Musk and everyday astronaut and and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's take a look at the fateful launch of Pixar. It didn't happen, and I'll provide some commentary as uh, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Sheep are 
nominal. Nominal. <laughs> there were lots of stage one propulsion is nominal. Lots of jokes about the sheep uh, watching the launch. Certainly the most scenic launch facility in the in the world. So We're at T plus forty five seconds into flight, and we've had a successful lift off from Pad A at Launch Complex One. Next up will be Max Q, to the point when the rocket is under the maximum amount of air damage. So everything looked good for about four minutes, I guess. This here is looking down the rocket at the southeastern tip of the North Island of New Zealand, the Mahia Peninsula. Very cool spot. Pass through Mexico. So at some point, um, I'm not sure at what time stamp, but it was, at some point, you're actually going to see a decal on the side of the rocket begin to peel up, which is unusual, but um, the, the, the general feeling is that that didn't have anything to do with the uh, problem which caused the loss of the, of the vehicle. Uh, it was just happened to happen. Um, so coming up are three events which will occur in close proximity AOS at Chatham first Station. the nine rutherford engines will power down on the first stage commonly known so unfortunately ah uh, see here the yeah, decals beginning to come up stage two separate. then stage the vacuum optimized engine on stage two will ignite as if you look at the altitude they're only about halfway to the carmen line at this point so they are still in atmosphere entering stage one burnout detect mode Miku confirmed. Okay, there was main engine cutoff and separation. Now, Electron is a small rocket, so it's normal to see it wobble a little bit on its way up. Um, Got a clean stage one and stage two separation. Electron is continuing on nominally. You can see the nozzle on that second stage engine beginning to glow as it makes. Now, at this warm. point, 100 kilometers, that's the Carmen line, which is the internationally recognized edge of space. Fairing jettison. There we see the fairing falling away, both fairings, fairing halves, I should say. The You've just seen it falling away from the vehicle there. The payloads are now exposed, ready for deployment. So according to a post uh, on their site, they mentioned that the problem occurred at about four minutes. Well, we're see, currently we're looking at 343, 344. Um, and that's earlier than than that's earlier than the problem became obvious when the video cut out and the um, orientation seemed to shift, the, tra the trajectory seemed to to skew. But um, the question remains as to whether that four minute mark was a was a typo or if something happened at four minutes that we can't see that they that they are aware of but we are not we're now four minutes into flight and electron is continuing to look good we've got a couple of boxes left to take off ahead of hitchamosen is saying look so before the video cuts out at, cut off what was it five minutes and some seconds uh, the engine gimbals a lot like it lost avionics or guidance navigation and control there was also mention of a change in the in the uh, the pattern of glow on the uh, engine nozzle, the Rutherford, little Rutherford engine. Bear in mind, these are very small engines. At Rutherford engines only like eight, like, I don't know, like eight, what is it, eight inches in diameter, something like that, um, as opposed to the... Stage two propulsion is nominal. Like the Falcon 9 Merlin engines, which are much larger. Now in about 90 seconds time, Electron will perform its battery hot swap. The pumps on the Rutherford engine are powered by batteries. Once these have been depleted, we swap power over to a new battery, allowing us to save mass on the way to orbit. 
so the transmission was a little little glitchy but it didn't actually cut out until the very end this is normal 200 seconds remaining altitude is 190 kilometers and speed is 3.8 kilometers sorry unfortunately um the only person in their broadcast who speaks clearly is the commentator uh everybody else sort of mumbles quietly into their mic which makes it difficult to hear what they're saying um i'd have to listen closely to catch all the uh, mission control chatter so okay so the here let's rewind a few seconds all right so what happens is Look at the look at the horizon for for your sense of of orientation. Um, altitude and speed are continuing to go up. Altitude is 190 kilometers and speed is 3.8 kilometers. Sorry, 8 kilometers per second. Feed battery discharge normal. Bridging hot spot roughly 30 seconds. And then the video freezes. So so if we if we jump back and forth, we can see. Okay, it's rotating, rotating, and then there's a sharp, comparatively sharp, uh, change in the in the attitude of the rocket. The video freezes, but the telemetry continues. But look at the numbers; they slow down. One forty one ninety four point four point five point six point eight one ninety four point eight and then it froze. The telemetry froze. Point seven point six point five and now it's starting to go down. So apparently it lost its thrust. And it's also losing, uh, okay, actually it wasn't quite losing altitude yet, but it lost its, Initiating the sap response I'm sorry, it lost its, so as you can it's see, losing its altitude and, and therefore is gaining speed as it, as it begins to descend. Above the Earth's surface as we're waiting for battery hot swap. So if you see in the, you can't see my mouse, but... In the center top, you see the, the gentleman with the curly hair. That's Peter Beck. He's the owner, the, the founder of uh, Rocket Lab. Kind of hard to read the faces of Mission Control because with the possible exception of SpaceX, um, Mission Control personnel don't generally display a whole lot of uh, emotion. SpaceX goes nuts. So, um, so that's all the video uh, we had of uh, Electron. Uh, once the video froze and cut out, uh, that's that's all that we got. Uh, afterwards, Rocket Lab. So they they terminated their their broadcast. They said without you know without video, that's all we're gonna show you. So have a nice day and goodbye. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and then afterwards, uh, there was a series of tweets. Um, an issue was experienced today during Rocket Lab's launch that caused the loss of the vehicle. We are deeply sorry to the customers on board Electron. The issue occurred late in the flight during the second stage burn. More information will be provided as it becomes available. Then there was a post by Peter Beck, who I just mentioned. Um, Rest assured, we'll find the issue, correct it, and be back on the pad soon. Um, this was a tough day for our team and mission partners. Um, and then a statement from Peter Beck uh, that I shall play for you now. To our customers, partners, and the entire Rocket Lab team, and all of our supporters out there, it's fair to say that today was a pretty tough day. During today's mission, late into the flight and after a successful liftoff, first stage burn, and stage separation, 
We experienced an issue on the way to orbit that caused the complete loss of the vehicle and unfortunately the payloads. To our customers, we are deeply sorry for the loss of those payloads. Believe me, we feel and we share your disappointment. However, we will leave no stone unturned to figure out exactly what happened today so that we can learn from it and get back to the pad safely. Electron is one of the most frequently launched rockets in the world today and after 12 consecutive launches to space, today's issue is a reminder that space flight can be very unforgiving. It's certainly a day we never wanted to experience, but one we had prepared for. Electron followed a safe re-entry trajectory within the safety corridor, causing no harm to personnel or property. We're working closely with the FAA to investigate the anomaly and identify its root cause and correct any issues to move forward. I have to say, I'm incredibly proud of the way the teams responded with professionalism today. Already as I speak, they're combing through the data to learn and prepare for the next mission. We have many Electron launch vehicles in production and we're ready for a rapid return to flight as soon as these, as soon as these investigations are complete and of course all the corrective measures are in place. We look forward to getting back to the pad very soon. Thank you for everybody's support. Yeah, so um, on their website, they had a, a longer um, monologue about the incident. Uh, no, no new, no new information though. They just said that it um, approximately four minutes into the flight, which is what people are wondering about because nothing obvious happened at four minutes. Um, but again, their investigation will, will hopefully yield the, um, uh, the root cause. Interestingly, they, okay, as a result, the payloads on board Electron were not deployed to orbit. Electron remained within the spec within the predicted launch corridors and caused no harm to personnel or the launch site. Um, Let's see. Oh, resulted in the safe loss of the vehicle. That's an interesting phrase, the safe loss of the vehicle. What that means is that, yes, the vehicle was lost, but it was lost um, uh, along the intended launch corridor, which was not uh, going to endanger any people. So it didn't, you know, it wasn't, didn't, uh, it didn't fail over land or over any populated areas, any islands, anything like that. It was over the Pacific, and um, so it, it didn't pose a danger to anyone. Um, thus, the safe loss of the vehicle, uh, i.e., the mission has failed successfully. Uh, which, which is what you want to happen. If, if there is going to be a contingency, if there's going to be a rapid unscheduled disassembly or an anomaly or anything like that, you want the failure to be, to, to have the, uh, the least impact, um, as possible. And yes, this was the 13th launch of Electron. Do with that what you will. I'm not, try not to be superstitious, knock wood, but <laughs> there you go. Um, all right, I do not know what Pablo is talking about, but I'm pretty sure that what he's saying is not appropriate. So I'm sorry if I misinterpreted that. Okay, so, um, oh yes, uh, a, a quick look at the launch statistics of the Electron rocket. So their ma the maiden flight back in 2017, remember this is a very young rocket. Uh, rocket Lab has been in the news a lot uh, the last couple of years because, um, I mean, they're a scrappy little rocket company with cool little rockets that are 3D printed, uh, and um, they've been doing great. Uh, their maiden launch was a failure due to, due to I think, um, an issue with the communications between the rocket and and uh, ground control, um, uh, but every th I mean all their all their production missions have been successful up to now. This is actually their first production launch failure. Um, so, out of you know thirteen launches, uh, two were were not successful. And then if you see here, they have a lot of launches uh, scheduled for later this year. I'm sure there will be some delay there due to this incident. 
uh, as they conduct their investigation. But as with all uh, rocketry related issues, uh, the launches will come. They'll just we'll just have to wait a little bit longer for them. Looking ahead, um, there is not a lot on the schedule. Uh, like I said, the the spacewalks that that were talked about uh, have not yet been publicly uh, put on the schedule. Um, there is a uh, Starlink 9 launch in a couple of days on Wednesday, July 8th at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.15 p.m. GMT. Uh, and then in nine days on July 14th at 4.51 p.m. Eastern Time, 8.51 p.m. GMT is the, uh, is, well, the first of three Mars missions that will hopefully be launching during this uh, July launch window. Um, this one is the HOPE mission from the United Arab Emirates, which will be launched on a Japanese H-2A rocket. And that's going up on the 14th. Um, there's another couple, let's see, uh, another couple launches later in the month that I will... Um, that I will, uh, if they if they get scheduled more concretely, I'll uh, cover them uh, later in the month in another Space Week episode. Uh, additionally, the other Mars missions, the Chinese Tianwen-1 and the, uh, the American Mars 2020 Perseverance rover mission, those are scheduled to launch, I mean, uh, their window is this month. So uh, once those get, um, once those launch dates get nailed down, I will provide them to you. And I sure hope that I had heard that the Mars 2020 was delayed, and I sincerely hope they don't miss this launch window, because otherwise it, they're going to have to wait another two years. But ultimately, it's better to launch late and successfully than to launch on time or early and uh, lose your payload, which you've worked so hard on. So... Um, again, we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Uh, looking to the chat, see if there are any pending questions. Chris V thinks we need to petition to remove the number 13 from existence. I mean, I used to work downtown in some of the big skyscrapers, and uh, sure enough, the, um, so, well, some of them, the, the, the older ones, with the physical buttons, uh, in the elevators, the, they were missing a number 13. And in fact, there is a 13th floor, but it was a maintenance floor. And um, it, it's funny because like, there was actually a button for the 13th floor, but it was on like, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't in the main panel of buttons. It was kind of on the inside of the door jam. And it said service only or something like that. And that's where their, their maintenance stuff is kept. So, anyway, superstition. It doesn't do anybody any good, but uh, it's kind of part of our DNA. So, uh, Lion Gaming is asking, when is the Mars Rover 2020 launch? Well, in 2020, <laughs> hopefully. So, um, because of the, the, uh, the way the orbits of Earth and Mars work. Every couple of years, every, what is it, 24 months or something like that, uh, 26 months, anyway, around every two years, uh, the planets enter an alignment which, which um, is optimal for launching missions to Mars because the planets are closer. You know, Obviously, if Mars is on the other side of the sun, we don't want to launch a mission there because it will take much longer to get there. So in order to optimize our our travel time to Mars, we're limited to launching uh, during a window every two years. And during this July is uh, uh, is one of those windows. So um, you know, apparently there has been some delay to the Mars 2020 launch, but um, the, they still have time within that within that window to to get it up. So um, let's cross our fingers so that we can see our our new rover on Mars in a few months. Uh, 
ESA Moonlander? Hmm. Sure, I can I can see if I can pull that up. Um What, this little guy? Lunar Lander spacecraft. ESA Lunar Lander. Hmm. Open image in new tab. There you go. How cute. <laughs> Those look like little Rutherford engines. <laughs> um, interesting design. Look at the um, uh, the landing pads are almost identical in shape to the uh, Apollo landing pads. Uh, Lion Gaming is asking when, so we're sort of jumping topics here, but uh, Lion Gaming is asking until when is the launch window for um, Mars 2020? Uh, that's a good question. And all right, first operates the first. Okay, this is according to NASA's uh, Mars 2020 like website. Um, First launch opportunity is scheduled for no earlier than July 30th. Okay, so no earlier than July 30th. Launch period opens July 30th and lasts through August 15th. So uh, just over two weeks starting at the end of this month, so July 30th through August 15th is the launch window for uh, Mars 2020. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I will go ahead and wrap up the broadcast. But first, I wanted to mention a friend of ours, um, Astronomy Films, who's actually one of our moderators and also, uh, also a YouTuber himself who produces um, many documentaries and short videos, um, mainly focused on spaceflight history. Uh, very fascinating and inspiring stuff. You should definitely go check out his channel. It's youtube.com slash astronomy films. Um, let's bump up his subscribers because he deserves it. He, his videos are great and, uh, and they deserve to be viewed and they're, they really are, they really are a treat. Um, so astronomy films, <laughs> check him out. All right. Hey, it's me again. So, um, with that, I'll go ahead and sign off. And I appreciate you all coming. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, hopefully we'll have some more news for you next week. Until then, keep it raw, and I will see you later. <laughs>